word for the Lord, and we'll let Brother Bart to get those sounds and things straight. Father, we thank you tonight because you're good. We love you because you first loved us. And we are so grateful for the privilege. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to come to your house. And people don't appreciate that. But we appreciate it. We appreciate it getting up this morning. We appreciate food. We appreciate clothing. And we come out because your word says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. No matter if the world goes completely crazy, we're supposed to still, those who know you, follow your word. So, Lord, thank you tonight for the faithful few who have come out of respect and reverence for your night, your uh, teaching, and your word yeah. that we might plant it in our hearts that we may not sin against you. I thank you for all that you have allowed us to do, and we are grateful for everything. Bless you now. Bless your word. Bless your teaching. Open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm excited because we've had some lessons here in the Last few uh, uh, times we've been on the radio, we've been uh, with Sunday message talking about, of course, the ingredients of a changed heart. And a heart can be a uh, heart can be many things. And so we're going to look at the heart tonight because a changed heart, but not necessarily for you to go over things. But I want you to be able to diagnose some things about people. When you meet people, you got to diagnose or you get a, an opinion. That's what we would say in law. You form an opinion about the person. Is that right? Uh, my grandpa used to say some folk don't have sadly sense, and it won't take you long to know it. <laughs> you, you would form an opinion about them based on the level of conversation, what they do, how they carry themselves, how they present. Amen? Uh, we're going to go back tonight to, to uh, look at, again, the prodigal son as one who it did not present himself in the very beginning right. Amen? Amen? He didn't respect his father. Is that right? That's in Luke chapter 15. But we want to look at that. But before we, we get to that in earnest, I thought it would be necessary to, to just remember and recall, if you will, the parable about the sword. In the fourth chapter of the book of Mark, Jesus talks about the sword. And the sower, uh, we recall, sows the word. Is that right? The sower sows the word. So he says, Hearken and behold, that went forth the sower to sow. And as he we came to pass, as he and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. You remember that? Fowls of the air, birds came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground. And then, it, because it had not much earth, immediately sprang up. And because it had no depth of earth, of course, ultimately, uh, the sun came up and scorched. Because it had no root, it withered away. That's two. The third one, some fell among the thorns and the thistles. Um, the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Verse 8 of child Mark 4 says, and others fell on what? Good Lord, we all hope we got good ground in our heart. Is that right? I was thinking about how that good ground in our heart, the Lord would use that to, to, to really uh, press the issue, I think. Good ground. Uh, is, is your mind good ground? Is your heart good ground? Or is it stony ground? Is it shallow ground? Is it crowded thorns and thistles? This is the issue tonight, how you sum up someone. You'll know a fruit, the fruit, the tree by the fruit, it bears. And so we want to look at that just in light of the prodigal son because when the Lord gave this parable, there were obviously four types of hearts you could have, four types of hearts. And he equated them to ground. And that, that, I was thinking about that on the way over here. Is it because we were made of dirt that he equated our minds to ground? Did he not tell Adam, dust thou art and dust thou shalt return for out of the ground I was taken? And then when we commend the body to the ground, we say, what, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust? And we tell him, it's going back to that, what, dirt. Yeah. And whenever the devil makes an appeal to us, he doesn't appeal to the highest nature, he appeals to the dirt in us. Is that right? right. And he always gets us to do something dirty. Is that right? Yeah. Something that will defile us, something that will make us uh, disobey God. So there is, a, there is a degree of dirt within us. Amen. So the Lord would say, what kind of ground is your heart? 
<laughs> kind of dirty thing. <laughs> and so he gives this parable. I find that in love, Brother Hubris. I say there are four types of hearts, and we want to uh, get that focused on, Brother Bartim, as we teach our lesson, because this parable presents four hearts. The first heart, you got a hard heart. The second heart, shallow heart. Third heart, where the thorns, thistles are, crowded heart. Fourth heart, good heart. So what this parable is teaching in Mark chapter 4 is the nature of hearts. And we all have varying degrees of hearts. Some days we have good hearts. Say amen. amen. And some days we just don't see it, don't want to see it. So we got a hard heart. Is that right? And other days we don't care. Now let me get to what I want to do. We got a shallow heart. Amen. And then we have so much to do, we can even have a crowded heart. And so God knows this already. He knows this, and he's trying to teach us. So three-fourths of the folk who come with a mindset come, 75%, they're not ready to hear. They're not ready to hear the truth. Uh, they want to hear something fatal. They want to, they're just too crowded, too hard, too shallow. It takes something to sit and listen and then evaluate yourself and come to yourself. That's what the prodigal son ultimately did. But he didn't start out that way. He started out with one of these three hearts up here. He started out with the whole idea, uh, I can't wait for my father to die. Uh, not that I might inherit it, uh, but I, I can't wait to get what's mine. Now, when you think about that, that surely is a hard heart. Because you would, why would you be in a hurry for your parents to die? Uh, you have to be uh, very out of focus, and uh, certainly the devil has appealed to you with material things. Did not the devil tell Jesus on the Mount of Temptation, all of the kingdoms of the world I will give you if you will fall down and do what? I mean, forget about God, worship me. And so material things come to take us away from our loved ones if we allow. And let me tell you something, the biggest fights in family were going to happen over what's mine, what mama left, what daddy left, and it doesn't belong to anybody but mama and daddy. I preach this because I see it so much. All right. Now, let's go now to this wonderful story that the Lord called the story or parable of the prodigal son. And that's a curious term, too, because we've learned that prodigal means wasteful. And for years we thought the prodigal son meant that you ran away from home. Uh, but it doesn't mean that. You can be at home and be still wasteful. Is that right? That's right. But the whole idea was he went into a far country and there became wasteful and lived his life in righteous living. So now let's look at the um, let's look at the parable and let's see this as it as it uh, begins. All right. And the Lord said at verse 11 of chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke these important words. And he said a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to him, to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Let's pause right now. What kind of heart does it take to tell your father or your loved one, give me mine, even though you're not dead yet, give me mine. Huh? Yeah. Now some fathers would give them exactly what they get. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. Amen. You didn't bring nothing here, and you're not taking nothing. Yeah. It takes a hard heart. This, this, this younger son represents the impetuosity of you. Is that right? Because when you're young, you think of the world. What was luring him so much away? Perhaps it was bright lights, big city, and riotous living. He wanted to live riotously. He didn't want to go there and go to church. Huh? He wasn't going to church. He wasn't going to revival. Dad, I want to go to revival. I want to get away from you, and I'm sick and tired of this lifestyle, and I want to have some fun. Is that what you'd say he'd say? Yeah. And it be working at how at the home doing the chores, uh, doing all cleaning up after animals. Uh, I've had it with that, and and y'all don't know what's going on. So he has a hard heart, but I, I want to look at that because 
Uh, the lure of the world is always there for children, and it's even there for adults. Yeah. It's amazing how the lure of the world is still there. This boy had a hard heart, because, and I think he had a hard heart because uh, he did not appreciate what his parent, his father, was doing. Oh, how many children missed the point? They take a house, a room, uh, food, a refrigerator, stove, hot and cold, running water. They take all that for granted. You're supposed to do that for me. I say, what? Huh? So this young man did not appreciate it, so he would insult his father to the utmost. And you know when you insult somebody, they don't forget it. They see, oh, well, you don't care for me. So he goes to his father, Father, give me all that fallen to me, and I want it now. I can't wait for you to die. And his father being maybe a, a lot wiser than we would have realized, amen, he gave it to him. Sometimes you give people enough rope and they'll do what? They'll do it every time. Yeah. So he went to the bank and drew out the money, divided it, and he was the second son. So the first son got a double portion. So the money that the father had had to be divided three different ways so that the first son would get two thirds and the second son would get one third. Firstborn got double portions. Right. Amen? Amen? So this young man, all he was after was a third. Looked like the one who could have uh, pressed the claim and stood for the game would have been the eldest son. Yeah. But the younger son, give me mine. Lord, have mercy, that personal pronoun. So father does this. And then the young man gathers everything together and he's on his way to have uh, not a revival, but pleasure. He was going to pleasure. Whatever pleasure was, he was going to be there. Is that right? That hasn't been that long. We can remember how foolish we were when we were young. Got on our clothes, dressed up, and thought we were looking good. Amen? Uh, we can remember that. We got to about this young man. And he took his journey, and he went. He didn't just go to Seguin. He went up to Houston on the other side of Houston, Bay Child. Huh? <laughs> he went way off into a far country. If he'd have gone to Seguin, we could have been down there to see what was going on. He went to a far country. <coughs> And in that country, he did everything he wanted to. His brother said he wasted his substance on harlots. And that was never refuted or rebutted. So whatever he did, he had wine, women, and song. And he made merry, and he made sure he had drinks for everybody. Buy another round. He was, you know, you're going to be popular, uh, just play to the crowd. Amen? But with the crowd, it's, it's fickle, because when the crowd uh, gets tired, you don't stimulate them any longer, they turn on you. Right. You, can't make, you can't buy friends either, mm -hmm. for that very reason. You can't buy friends. So this young man goes and wastes his living, wastes his substance, and rides his living. Now, that shows not only him having a shallow heart. Well, you know, you always put up some money for a rainy day. And if you were going to get it all at one time, you were supposed to put something back. Right. So not only he had a hard heart, he had a shallow heart. And then how he spent his money showed that he had a crowded heart. He didn't know what he wanted, some of this and some of that. We used to go to the store when we were little and when things were a penny and a nickel uh, candy uh, and you had 25 cents, I thought you were almost rich. Because you could have five of them, five of them, five more of them. And yes, you were doing real good. Back in those days when things sold puppies, somebody know what I'm talking about. If you had a quarter, if you had a dollar, you were just, uh, you were the wealthiest person in the whole town uh, because they sold things. This young man had a crowded heart as if a kid in a candy store. He did everything he wanted to do, and that crowded heart did not serve him well. Why? 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 Because he ran out of money. And when he ran out of money, he ran out of friends. And when he ran out of money, he ran out of friends, he had no backup plan. As they said, he had no exit strategy. Right. He was plumb out of money. He didn't even get a round trip ticket. Whatever he did, he did one way. Yeah. Ain't never coming back. That would speak of his heart uh, again. And so now it's famine. A famine arose. And a famine was means there was no food, there's no opportunity. I don't care what kind of money you had. You could not get the type of food you wanted. And so this young man had to go out and work again. 
with something he didn't want to do in the first place. Yeah. You know, it, it always amazes me. Children think they're running away from home to get away from work. Uh, they don't know what work is until you get away from home and discover if you want to eat, you got to work. If you want water, you got to work for it. If you want TV and cable, work. Everything has work on it. And they don't see that because they have a blind heart, a shallow heart. So this young man runs out of everything and he has to work and joins himself to what? A farm. And, uh, and he goes out into the field to feed swine. Now that was the lowest job a Jew could have because a Jew wasn't to touch a swine, a pig. It was an unclean animal. Uh, we know uh, hogs eat slop. And all they brought the husk for the slop for the hogs. This man was so hungry. And you can get hungry. You can let yourself go until he thought about it. Nobody was looking but the hogs. And he said, boy, this look good. Hogs said, don't eat our food. So, <laughs> the hogs said, don't you eat our food, but it's our food, we hogs. We, he's eating our food. He would have fain eaten the husk that he was feeding the, the swine. Now, here's where I want to get to, because a change of heart remind, involves several crucial elements. First of all, it involves an assessment of where you've been and who you've been. you got to go back over your past and say, oh, you, in order to come to the fact that you were a fool, you got to evaluate some of the foolish things you've done. I was a fool to insult my father. I was a fool to take this money and not prepare for the future. I was a fool to waste it in riotous living, and I did not have a good heart. Nothing about me was good. So he's there debating, but he's coming to himself because he's evaluating himself. And in evaluating himself, now he's going to look at himself truthfully. Amen? Yeah. Perhaps at home he wasn't ready to look at himself truthfully. I'm, I'm somebody. I'm this and that. But when you get out there, the world can really tell you who you are. You have some folk who sit at desks and sit at windows and uh, who are the gatekeepers, and they can tell you, you don't belong here. <laughs> they can tell you, you're too poor to come in here. And so this young man sat down and evaluated himself and said, you know what? The servants at my father's house are treated better than I'm at, uh, than the station I'm in right now. they treated better than I am right now. And so he had to now evaluate and come to the truth and then set a priority. He had to set a priority. Let's look at that. Let's look at that because he says, let's go to this. And he went and joined himself to a former and he would fain have, I'm in verse 16, have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man, that's another portion, gave unto him. All those friends he had, all the so-called friends, ran out on him as soon as that money ran out, they ran out. And when he came to himself, and the old folks would teach this back in college and Park and say, well, at least he came to himself. He came to himself, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. Now, when nothing else can teach you, your brain, your IQ, your privileged learning, your stomach can talk language you understand. Oh, and the stomach said, send some real food down here, Mr. <laughs> and he said, I don't have any. And the stomach probably had said, what? You don't have any food? What's the matter? What happened all that money? What's the matter with you? So he comes to himself and says, I will arise. He has a plan. I will arise and go to my father. Listen to this. It would be enough if he begged for his father. Most people would come to their father or mother now. They just beg. But they got to say something with that. It says, I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned. The repentance has to be there. Not the fact I need some more money. Yeah, yeah. It means some more what? You know, where's the, where's the learning? Where's the character development? Where's the integrity? Where's the side of you that comes to the end of the foolish side and now the powerful side, the spiritual side, the mature side is now taking over? Because only when we see that mature side are we going to feel comfortable enough to trust you with anything. So he says, I have sinned against who? Heaven and before thee. Oh, thank you, Lord, this young man is coming to himself. And he says, and furthermore, if I look at the heart I have, how I insulted you, 
how I made no plan for the future, and how I wasted my money on riotous living. I am not worthy to be called thy son, because you raised us better. Isn't it good when a child comes to that? Mama, Daddy, you raised us better. I'm not going to do such a thing because I was raised right. And so when a parent sees that, they, they, get, they get blessed by it. So he says, I'm not worthy to be called thy son. Tell you what, Daddy, make me as one of the hired servants. That's what he was, his plan was. And he came to himself, he rationalized, he prioritized, and then he repented. If there is no repentance, there can be no change. Many people want to change in their life, but they want to keep on doing the same thing. And insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. And you do the same thing, you're going to get the same thing. You behave the same way, you're going to end up the same way. And our, our, our young people, and sometimes our old people, can't see this. If you really want to make a change in your life, stop doing the same dumb thing. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And so this young man comes to that point and all what a father he had because his father still loved him. His father loved him even though he wasted all that money. Some parents today, we can get over the fact, how much money did you waste? You lose all, oh, I just got sick over it. You know, that's $30,000. Well, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Let's just say, let's use that as a round figure. You lost $30,000 and you hear back here too, but two weeks later, <laughs> you didn't even stay food two months. You, you leave because it's day two months and stay away from me, my refrigerator. So this, 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 this was egregious. This was very serious. Uh, this young man came uh, to his father, begged for the money, and now he comes home a different young man. Now what makes him different is because he got different eyes. He has a different heart now. His heart has gone from hard, shallow, crowded, to a good heart. And it took hard times to bring out a good heart. It take, took being without and being destitute to come to yourself. And sometimes, church, that's the way it is. Uh, when we got things sewn up, when we healthy, uh, we don't think to pray about our health. But you let us get a bad report or have to go for a test. All of a sudden, lots of prayer, lots of prayer. Lord want to hear from us on those times when he's given us good help. So we can get up and give a good testimony. I thank and praise God for what he's given me. This young man had to come to himself, and when he did, he gave an accurate assessment. He didn't lie. Some children would say, you know, Dad, I had the money, and I was wrong. Somebody took my money. I don't know where my money went. I had a preacher one time come here before he went to heaven. Uh, in my youth, I had this preacher come. He came to this church. And I, I said, you want to? He said, um, I asked him if he wanted to preach or something. Yeah, I'm going to preach. And so to let me know how much money he wanted to preach. He said, you know, I had $150 in my water. Somebody took that out of there. I said, this man ain't no different than when I was a child. He's still telling the same stuff. <laughs> I had $150. You can look at it and tell you that. Then when I went to this funeral, everybody told the same story. Uh, <laughs> Lord have mercy. I ain't going to call his name. You know it. But he was like that. And so yeah, yeah. some children would say, Daddy, somebody brought, robbed me. I lost my wallet. But this young man said, I, I wasted it. I'm not worthy to be called your son. In fact, Daddy, it's all right with me if you don't call me. What kind of growth is that? Boy, the father must have been listening to me. Really, with keen ears then, you say, what? I'm not worthy to be called your son. In fact, it's all right if you disinherit me. That father really loved that son. Because he fell on his neck and kissed him when he came home. He was so glad to see that boy. And the story is really not about a prodigal son. It's about a forgiving father who was insulted in the very beginning, who still found it within his heart to forgive that erring son when the son came home with the right attitude. And it's the right attitude God wants from us. Amen. God wants to hear from us, but he wants to hear the right stuff. He don't want to hear that stuff we tell everybody else. Yeah. That stuff that goes on in the barber shop and beauty shop and nail shop. All that stuff ain't going to sell. What's going to get you into heaven is, Lord, I'm sorry. Right. 
And so this young man came, I'm not even worried if you call your son. It's all right with me if you don't make me your son. If I can sleep out there with the servants, I'll be all, get enough to eat, I'll be all right. Yeah. His daddy said, now bring forth the best robe. Bring forth the fatted calf. This my son who was lost is found. This my son who was blind, now he sees. And it was amazing because God is just like this father. His father, they tell me, when the boy was a great distance off, walking in the distance, coming home, the father got up and ran, and it was undignified for an old man to run, but it was his boy. And he said, I'm going to get that boy. That boy is my finally come home. He's come to himself. Last week, I believe Sister Baker was telling about Sister Babylon's dog. Everybody who's gone over to visit Sister Babylon knows she has a dog named Bozo. Bozo left home, and nobody could find him. And Sister, ba Sister Baker was telling how she prayed, and Bozo came home. Nothing like something coming home, isn't it? Even a dog knows when to come home. So we thank God when people know when to come home, and they come home with the right attitude. And that attitude is, Father, forgive me. And Father said, that's all I wanted to hear from you. Now I'm going to treat you right. I'm going to bless you. That was the problem with the elder son, and as we, we end that, we know the problem with the elder son was that the elder son knew his brother was in there. And they were having a party, and they were killing a fatted calf, and he wouldn't come in to the make merry with his brother. Isn't that something? I ain't going in there. Imagine he was saying a lot of things, and the servant told his dad, your uh, elder son's out the field, he doesn't want to come in. I said, what? But the father went out to him, just like a loving father. Now, fathers today would say, well, if you don't want to come in, let them stay out there until they're free. Huh? <laughs> That's the way most daddies would say, you don't want to come, you stay out there, then we're going to go ahead and you just go and be mad. But this father was really a picture of a good father. He went out there and entreated, son, why are you mad? Oh, all I have is yours now. I gave you for your brother all that was his. Well, I've been with you all these years. And all he wanted was a party. And you never made a party for me. By the time this thug come home uh, from chasing the women and running up and down the street, you give him a party. Right. And so the little father said it was meant that he should come home and we should make merry. He was lost in his life. This, this prodigal son teaches us that if you really want to change in your life, you got to do self-assessment. you got to look at those hearts you had. And then you've got to confess them before God. Before you notice, the, the Jesus put the good, good heart at the bottom. Because we don't necessarily start with a good heart. We start as a baby, we start as a teenager, and some of us adults still crowded and crooked. Hmm? If it's crooked, somebody took it, huh? That's <laughs> Alvin John Stevens. But good is where you have to grow to. You don't start good. You gotta come to good. And the prodigal son came to good as we have to come to good. Because we have instances where we still man. We have some chairs we don't want folks to sit in. Mm -hmm. When I was in one church, you couldn't sit in a church in a certain chair, mm -hmm. a certain pew, because that certain person yeah. sat in that pew. Yeah. And they'd come up and tell you, they got out of my seat. Yeah. Now you're coming to worship God. <laughs> huh? You're looking at Jesus, and somebody's looking at if I can just jerk you out of that seat, I can worship God. Uh, Is that right? Uh, oh, that's in the folk. That's in folk, especially in us. Amen? God wants you to self-analysis, do self-analysis. So you come to yourself. And I believe there's areas of growth God wants to use. And if God is no respecter of person, nor is he respecter of age, nor is he respecter of circumstance. God can use anybody. He can take a bird to fly in here and sing this little light of mine better than we ever heard. Amen? So if he can do that with a bird, think what he can do with a human being. God wants to still use us. It will come to the end of some of our selfishness and admit we're selfish. Amen? How much does it take to admit you're selfish? Uh, act of lightning, a meteorite, asteroid, <laughs> lightning, and it was thunder and lightning tonight. Uh, get in that bed, oh Jesus, I'll be better now. Uh, it takes some things to get us that doesn't come automatic. But the, but, uh, but the prodigal son, it didn't come automatic. It took great feats of, of loss of money, loss of friends, and then loss of food supply. And then he had to come to himself. 
God is a God of much diversity. Some he can draw to them, others he has to take the long way around, beat it out of them through circumstances. And then they're ready. Moses was ready to take over Egypt, and then he went and killed an Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. And it took him 40 more years to approach that leadership again. And he had that time, and then he said, who am I that I should be? Uh, he was ready 40 years earlier. He said, I know who I am. First in my class, I'm first in deeds. Nobody's mightier or prettier than I am. But 40 years later, uh -uh, I can't do that. I said, I'll go with you. Still wasn't ready. Amen? Right. So that 40 years did something to him. God wants to use us. And I just don't know how many ways he wants to use us. But I'm, my lesson is, he still wants to use you. And don't you think you have forgotten don't you think you're forsaken? And don't you think that you're so uh, wrapped up in the world that the Lord could never use you in a mighty way? God delights in taking little and making much from it. And taking ordinary people and doing extraordinary things. And he wants to do that. God bless you tonight. And may you have a show of peace. We're going to stand and have our we're so glad to see Sister Richard with us. She told me she wanted to come to Bible study. I'm glad that the young people, the children, got you here. Amen. <laughs> well, that's all right. You fall, you won. <laughs> you sure do. We got to go have you come up here. We're just going to come to you. How's that? We're going to come to the second few. You're the only one to get up, Sister James. If you don't want to, just.